He invented modern makeup, handcrafted Hollywood signature looks, and started a beauty revolution that launched a billion faces. Max Factor, tonight on Hollywood Fashion Machine. It's hard to imagine glamour without makeup, but before the movies, modern cosmetics didn't exist. Almost every basic product in today's makeup kit was invented specifically for the film industry by a cosmetics genius named Max Factor. It was only when women saw how fabulous Max's products looked on Hollywood stars that they began demanding makeup for themselves. This sparked both an angry backlash and a beauty revolution. Ultimately, women today look the way we do because of the movies and a gentle little man from Eastern Europe who arrived in Hollywood with a dream of glamour. Today, makeup and glamour go hand in hand. A multi-billion dollar industrial colossus, the cosmetics industry markets its products to over a billion women on every continent. The worldwide craze for cosmetics began with the glamorous images of Hollywood which first inspired and then utterly reinvented the face of the modern woman. Behind Hollywood's great faces was not only a great inventor, but a friend, confidant, and father confessor to the stars. They called Max Factor Pops, told him their problems, and doted on his every word. As well they should, since he devised many of the looks that made them famous. He was a father figure to all the stars. He listened to their troubles, gave them advice. He was absolutely charming. Uh, and he made them look gorgeous. What more could you want? We connect Max Factor with just about any famous movie star face of the 30s and 40s that you can think of. He didn't belong to just one studio. He did everybody. Max had a genius for finding just the right look that could utterly transform a star. Joan Crawford's famous lips, for example, may have defined her image, but Max defined her lips. Max Factor decided for Joan that she had to have a mature star's mouth to show that she was not a new girl on the block. He called it the smear. So it was the, the, the big, big lips. <laughs> Just went right across the mouth. <laughs> so they went all the way from North Dakota to San Diego <laughs> on, on either side of her face, and they were very indelibly etched, a much bigger mouth than she really had. When Jean Harlow begged him for a color scheme to help her break out of the Hollywood pack, an American icon was born, the platinum blonde. He made it this gorgeous platinum color, very bright, very white. And then, for the first time, he was able to, to come up with new cosmetics, new makeup, to really set this hair off well. Marlene Dietrich, he dusted golden flecks into her hair so she would look absolutely angelic. And for Garbo, he developed false eyelashes, which even enhanced her eyes. And those were the first false eyelashes known. All the stars wanted them after that. You can see how it defined characters, it created characters, like Joan Crawford and Greta Garbo. They, they were their makeup. They were the shape of their lips. They were the shape of their eye. They were their makeup. Without that, they were nothing. The seeds of Hollywood glamour were planted in the unlikely soil of old Russia when Max's poor family packed him off to work as a makeup apprentice in 1878. He was only six. By 20, Max was such a master of his craft that the Russian royal family commanded him to come to court and make up the faces of its grand duchesses. Guards escorted him everywhere, and as a Jew working for one of the world's most anti-Semitic monarchies, Max was almost a slave. The Tsar even forbid him to marry. He met and fell in love with a young girl in, in his hometown and secretly snuck a rabbi in through the back door and married her. He had three children in Russia before he left. By 30, Max was desperate to escape his gilded cage and used his mastery of makeup to concoct a plan. He used uh, makeup to make himself look sallow, uh, kind of a yellowish color. Just as he hoped, his superiors thought he was dying and ordered him to a spa in Germany. Once there, he smuggled his family to a seaport and then to the safety of the new world. But those first years were filled with tragedy and disappointment. His beloved wife died, leaving him with four small children. 
And although he had dreamed of the fortune he could make by bringing the beauty secrets of the Romanovs to the new world, America in 1908 was hardly a mecca for makeup. Cosmetics really were only worn, I mean only worn, by stage actors and by fancy ladies, prostitutes. Um, it was just not something that quote unquote nice women wore. The exception to that is some women would wear very light powder and maybe some moisturizing cream. The resilient Max soon remarried and brought his family west, following rumors of a new industry in the little city of Los Angeles. If he couldn't sell the beauty secrets of Russian royalty to the average American woman, perhaps he could sell them to this new American royalty, the motion picture stars. Something was happening in Los Angeles. People were making movies, and he thought uh, that might be something fun to get into. In those early days, actors mostly concocted their own crude makeup. So after Max opened a small barber shop, he began selling theatrical grease paint on the side. Since he was the only game in town, actors flocked to his little shop. But the greasy stage makeup he imported from Germany was thick and heavy and cracked under the hot movie lights. The new film actors were ready for their close-ups, but the old stage makeup wasn't. All of a sudden, photography and films realized we could get really close and frame someone from, from forehead to chin, that very stiff, makeup all of a sudden was aging and hideous and, and, and very ineptly applied. Desperate to get ahead, Max Factor experimented for long hours in the little lab behind his shop, while his wife and children tended the business up front. Then came the breakthrough invention that would change both his fortunes and the look of early cinema, a, a flexible grease paint. It was the very first makeup design just for the movies, and it allowed stage actors to really get a whole range of emotions with their face. Within months, every movie star from Charlie Chaplin to Lillian Gish was using Max's new flexible makeup. It was only 1914, the dawn of cinema, and Max had already become one of the industry's indispensable men. He traveled to the studios on his little bicycle and makeup kit to work on the stars at the locations where they were filming. Within the humble manner he had cultivated under the oppressive thumb of the Romanovs, Max had no trouble handling even the most temperamental star. But inside the sweet man with the Yiddish accent lurked a fierce ambition, a keen eye for opportunity, and the soul of a great inventor. For every problem that cropped up as movie making evolved, Max had a creative solution that revolutionized his field. For example, solid lipstick had not been invented an old-fashioned lip pomade ran under the hot lights. What Max Actor decided to do was to put white makeup all across an actor's entire mouth area, the lips, everything was white, and then applying uh, red or some dark color to, the, to his thumb, he would put two thumbprints on the upper lip and one thumbprint on the lower lip to keep the color centered in the center of the mouth so that the color could not run and pool at the corners of the mouth. They called it the bee stung look, and it caused a sensation. But it didn't take long for Max to devise a more permanent solution, one that remains the most basic beauty product in any handbag. He invented lipstick as we know it. Um, before that, it was a lip pomade, and it melted. And so he then invented this hard stick. Throughout the 20s and 30s, Max astonished the film industry with one major invention after another, products that propelled him from the owner of a little barber shop to CEO of Max Factor Incorporated the world's leading cosmetics manufacturer. I'll tell you why Max Factor is so important, because before Max Factor, there was no lipstick, there was no pancake, there was no mascara, there was no, uh, uh, you name it, there was nothing. He created it all for movies, specifically for movies. Enduring cinematic inventions like the powder brush and that sexy staple, lip gloss, positioned him as the leading cosmetics inventor of the age. In order to get sort of sexy, shiny lips on camera, actresses would lick their lips again and again and again to the point where they would become very chapped. And so Max Factor de developed, using pretty simple ingredients, a product that made lips shiny all the time without having to lick it. Today we know it as lip gloss. Carbon lights washed out facial details, especially around the eyes. So Max devised a solution that further secured his reputation as the father of modern makeup. He came up with the mascara wand, you know, the, that everyone uses now. And, you know, basically he was such an innovator. Perhaps Max's most revolutionary invention was not a product, but an idea. 
He argued that every person has a natural color scheme based on hair, eyes, and skin, which determines which makeup tones look best. He called it color harmony. This was a new thing. I mean, now we all take color harmony for granted. But back in those days, there was only a, a kind of a one-note makeup. Max was trying to turn makeup into a precise modern science. In the case of color harmony, it worked. In other cases, it didn't. We had this calibrator, and it was this, it was this contraption that you put on your face, and you turn little screws, and the distance of the different screws that they're out was his measuring device. And then based on what the calculation would come out to be, they designed your makeup look for you. The beauty calibrator never caught on, but Color Harmony sure did, and so did Max Factor Incorporated, which by 1920 had become indispensable to the glamorous faces of Hollywood. But out in America, when respectable women went to the movies, they still didn't wear makeup. When Hollywood Fashion Machine returns, protests, demonstrations, and divorces as makeup arrives on Main Street. As America entered the Roaring Twenties, emancipated suffragettes and flappers fought to test the limits of old-fashioned respectability. Up on the silver screen, so did the movie stars. But they did it looking gorgeous in Max Factor makeup. It wasn't long before the girls sitting in the darkened theaters decided that Clara Bow's bee-stung lips and Theda Barra's daring rouge and shocking mascara looked pretty cool. A visionary in business as well as cosmetics, Max sensed the opportunity to bring his movie makeup to every main street in America. Max saw that if he could create an acceptance amongst the average woman with makeup and get them to wear makeup, obviously that's huge. But Max had a big problem. Almost no one knew how to put on the stuff. Before the 1920s, there weren't very many people wearing makeup. So how would you learn how to put makeup on? Your, your mother or your grandmother or your older sister could not teach you. You had to go to, to some other place to learn how to put it on. Max decided to enlist America's corner druggists, who had always sold basic cold creams and powders. By now, his sons and sons-in-law all worked in the family business, and he sent them across the country to train druggists in the principles of color harmony. To create more business for them, it was a win-win between the pharmacists and the cosmetic manufacturer. When Max launched the complete first line of makeup designed for the average woman, he ditched the highbrow word cosmetics in favor of a phrase that had always been tainted by its association with tawdry actresses, makeup. Max Factor was taking a chance when he decided to refer to cosmetics as makeup. It was a theatrical term. Other people were using the word cosmetics because they thought it was more genteel for society women. But Max understood, better than anyone else, how Hollywood was overturning the age-old image of the acting profession. In the 1920s, the idea of acting as a quote-unquote tainted profession was fading away. The image of actresses were coming into every movie theater all across America. And for the first time, women started looking up to actresses rather than looking down on them and thinking, hey, that Clara Bow is really beautiful, or Mary Pickford, she's just the best thing ever. I, I want to look like her. He used the word makeup because he wanted to connect the celebrities, the movie stars, with the average woman. And his idea was that all women would want to emulate the movie stars, and in fact, they do. But as Max's products swept society, they sparked a fierce reaction, and makeup became the hot button issue of the day. From California to Boston, teachers were fired and husbands divorced wives for wearing lipstick and rouge. The Arkansas Supreme Court upheld a law prohibiting students from wearing powder and paint. And Pope Pius himself announced a sacred crusade against the evils of makeup. Women fought back, determined to exercise their right to rouge. From today's standpoint, it might seem strange to think of makeup as a form of women's lib, but things looked very different to women emerging from the restrictive Victorian age. It wasn't as easy to express yourself necessarily, particularly in appearance. If you wanted to, to you know, look a vamp or look a different part, you really needed makeup to do that. If you wanted to be a glamorous woman of the city, you could do that with makeup. You really could determine your own image with makeup. A quiet family man who hated controversy, Max Factor refused to comment on the fractious debate his inventions had sparked. But then he didn't need to. By the end of the 20s, the opposition to makeup was smothered under mountains of mascara and oceans of rouge. Cosmetics won the culture war, and Max Factor was the brand on almost every face in America. 
what would you compare that to today? Maybe, maybe Microsoft or it's almost like the post office. If you want to mail a letter, you have to send it to the post office. If you want to be made up, you got to talk to Max Factor. Max encouraged his enterprising sons to take senior positions in the family business, just as they had helped out in the shop as children. Under their guidance, sales boomed on Main Street. But Max kept his personal focus on Hollywood. Quiet! 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 And the coming of sound pictures presented him with his biggest challenge ever. Sound required new, silent lights. They, in turn, changed the look of films, which in turn required a whole new kind of makeup. And so Max Factor developed a new makeup um, that looked very natural and, and very good with this new lighting. It was called panchromatic makeup. Designed for black and white, it looked bizarre in real life. The women would wear a very dark brown lipstick that would read as red on black and white film. So it was quite unbelievable. And it must have been quite horrifying to look at these people. In an industry noted for its big time egos and famous feuds, Max was refreshingly different. Devoted to his wife, children, and grandkids, he got along with everybody, had allies in every studio. Max Factor was the, the nicest, sweetest, dearest little man you would ever want to meet. He spoke English, but always with a broken accent, a very heavy accent, which was part of his charm. Max was such a Hollywood institution that a character based on him was written into the 1937 version of A Star is Born. Anyway, it's just a rough sketch. Pretty small mouth, eh? Oh, well. Give her that Crawford smear. Beyond merely inventing modern makeup, Max also revolutionized advertising with a radical new concept, the celebrity endorsement. They would get a dollar to promote his makeup, and they would do advertisements. And then he, in return, would put posters of their faces in their movies in drugstores and wherever he sold cosmetics. Luscious lips, provocatively soft. Max's inspiration is still Madison Avenue's favorite way to sell makeup. Thanks, Max. I'm going to say once again in two words what Max Factor was. Three words, genius, and the other two words are smart cookie. You know what that would cost now? That would cost hundreds of zillions of dollars if you could even get Gwyneth Paltrow or Julia Roberts or Meryl Streep to say that they used products. Thanks to Max's inventive genius and marketing skill, he succeeded in bringing the beauty secrets of Russia's royalty to America's Hollywood royalty and then to women everywhere. But his success had unintended consequences. How makeup turned starlets to thieves and foiled a kidnapping plot. When Hollywood Fashion Machine continues. The greatest challenge of movie makeup had always been finding products that worked in black and white. But in the mid-30s, makeup artists faced a new challenge, Technicolor. It was the greatest cinematic innovation since sound, and it promised to totally transform the movie-going experience. But first, Hollywood needed Max Factor to solve a little problem. Namely, actors and actresses refused to appear in Technicolor films. The reason was simple enough. People looked ghastly in Technicolor. Makeup absorbed color, so if you were standing by a green tablecloth, your face became green or red or whatever the surrounding color was. The fact that makeup reflected surrounding colors was a huge impediment. So Max went back to the lab and without realizing it, emerged with the greatest single product in cosmetics history. And so he invented this makeup that you applied with a wet sponge and dabbed on the face and it would suddenly make your face look attractive and natural and even toned. Since it was panchromatic and came in the form of a little cake, he called it pancake, and it instantly solved the Technicolor problem. But a different problem cropped up when actresses began using Max's new pancake makeup for the first time in Vogue's of 1938, theft. They started taking it home with them, and some of the extras took some home with them. Soon, Hollywood studios were losing a fortune. It seemed like entire crates of pancake were walking off the lot. Just tell the truth, Gamble. And it didn't take long to figure out why. Pancake makeup, designed for Technicolor, was the best-looking real-life makeup women had ever seen. That single product, my grandfather, who became the president and CEO 
of Max Factor, who we grew up with, used to always talk about how great it was and how many millions of dollars they sold of it and how it took the company from this very small company to from this very big company with this one revolutionary product. I tell you, without Pancake, I wouldn't be sitting here today because, uh, you know, it gives you the coverage that you need to, to totally block out the skin. And I have freckles, and uh, you would see a lot of my freckles. In 1939, when I was 17 years old, I had terminal acne. And a girlfriend of mine said, Helen, pancake makeup, Max Factor has created this. It's for the movies, but now us girls can have it too. It cost a dollar fifty cents, which was my allowance for three weeks. <laughs> and I just like to say, dear Max up in heaven, wherever you are, you changed my life. In a town where blockbusters are rare, Max had scored nothing but mega hits for years. Big news from Hollywood, the premiere of Max Factor's colossal makeup studio. So in 1935, when he threw a gala to inaugurate his new headquarters, it was the party of the decade, which for Hollywood in the 30s is saying a lot. Over 10,000 people showed up for this party. Everybody who was anybody in Hollywood was there. By 1938, Max Factor was 66 years old and at the peak of his success. He was one of the richest men in Hollywood. Surrounded by a large, loving family, he was also a friend and confidant to dozens of the world's most glamorous women. But for Max, it was all about to end. Poor Max. Saw a friend across the street from, from the salon on Highland Avenue and was running across the street to greet his friend. And he was hit by a truck. Max was really never the same after that. His injuries didn't stop him from traveling to Europe the next year. But in Paris, an anonymous letter threatened that Max would be kidnapped unless he appeared in person with a payoff. Once again, makeup rescued him, just as it had decades before in Russia. The authorities disguised a decoy to look like Max, and the plot was foiled. But a deeply shaken Max returned to Los Angeles in broken health, and just a few weeks later, he was dead. Hollywood mourned the man who had engineered one of the greatest fashion revolutions in modern times. Now the family company that he had built from scratch would have to go on without him. In true Hollywood style, one of the first orders of business was to come up with a sequel. So Max's son, Frank, was renamed Max Factor Jr. There had to be a Max. I think they drew straws and Frank got to be Max. They thought that it would just kind of carry on the family tradition better. It was actually pretty cool because a lot of people didn't know that Max Factor died. So when Frank changed his name to Max, people thought it was still the same Max Factor. The new Max Factor Jr. had spent years by his father's side in the lab. So it's not surprising that the innovations just kept coming indelible lipstick, the first made-for-TV makeup, pan stick, and a host of other products. But eventually, Max's sons grew older, the family grew larger, and times changed. They had taken the business public in the 1960s, but due to a number of circumstances, including um, the untimely death of one of the family members and um, different interests, I think, of family members, they decided that it was best to sell the company, and they did in 1973. Procter & Gamble now owns Max Factor, and today's generation of factors is no longer involved with the company that bears their name. But that doesn't mean they have nothing to do with makeup. Tucked away in a corner of Los Angeles is Smashbox, the city's trendiest photo studio, which also markets a popular line of cosmetics. It's innovative and edgy and creative and funny. They really have continued on the family line of, of making women look beautiful. Everybody in Hollywood knows Smashbox, but very few know it was founded and is owned by Max Factor's great-grandsons, Dean and Davis Factor. We both thought, oh, you know, people are going to think we're copying our grandfather, our great-grandfather. So we were a little concerned at first. And even in the publicity, and the way we market the product, we never mention Max Factor at all. It's always Smashbox, comes from Smashbox Studios, you know, designed by Davis and I. It's a family business. And in that respect, my brother and I are kind of carry on the legacy of the family business. The family legacy that Dean and Davis have inherited from their great-grandfather is, quite simply, the invention of almost every product that forms the basis of the modern cosmetics industry. There are a lot of men like that in the 20th century who we're able to, to be the, the first in, in, this, in this industrial age at something. And it just so happens that Max Factor 
is that man when it comes to uh, makeup and cosmetics. He was, he was the Thomas Edison of cosmetology. It can be said that the business of Hollywood is to create beautiful dreams or illusions, and the business of makeup is to, to help people create those beautiful dreams. It's a long way from the court of old Russia to the studios of modern Hollywood, and amazing to think that a man trained to serve one world would totally transform the second. Max Factor's dream was to take the jealously guarded secrets of royal beauty and reveal them to the women of the world. Did he succeed? Just look at any movie. Or for that matter, just look around.